with the best brand of football in Idaho, this is the 8-Man Prep Cast on IdahoSports.com. That's right. Welcome in. Another edition of the Idaho 8-Man Prep Cast on IdahoSports.com. Brandon Bainey, as always, joined by Will Henneke. Here we are. The final week of the regular season has arrived. It seems like only yesterday we were talking about the 8-Man Classic in Middleton, but here we are. Wow. Yep. Yep, that the the mornings have cooled, the evenings have cooled. It's not hot and sweaty anymore. You actually have to break out your jacket. Yeah, and you're wearing, uh, you've got the jacket on today, yep. looking sharp. If you want to see what Will, uh, what kind of threads Will is wearing, uh, you can watch the video version of this at the IdahoSports.com YouTube channel or Facebook page. Audio only, also available at IdahoSports.com and wherever you download your podcasts. All right, let's let's get into it. I just published it this morning. The Idaho High School Football Bubble Watch Part 3. Who's in, who's out for 5A all the way down to 1A D2. If you want to check that out, it is on the homepage at idahosports.com. For our purposes, we'll talk just the eight-man game and again, the storyline continues to be in 1A D1 football. These at-large bids more than likely are going to go to teams exclusively from districts four, five, and six, which means the White Pine League only gets three bids. So let's start there. Here's what we know uh, up north. We know that Kamii has clinched. They they have won the conference, even with a loss on Friday. Um, they have defeated um, Clearwater Valley in the head-to-head matchup. That's the only other team that could tie them in the standings. So they're one. Clearwater Valley similarly has clinched second place. The Rams, think about this. When I started this exercise two weeks ago, the Rams were on the outside looking in, according to the playoff bubble. And we said, you know, it's not time to panic in Kuski. The Rams can win out and play their way into the playoffs. And that's exactly what they've done. So round of applause for Clearwater Valley. When they needed to the most, they have uh, started winning the really crucial contests. Yeah, they've they've done a really nice job. They've got a nice team there, and 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 we've been saying in general for the better part of a month. And I mean, it's Captain Obvious speaking here, but you know, winning cures a lot of a lot of things. And you know, Clearwater Valley took a couple L's early, but then what they did is when when they got back on that roll, they stayed on that roll. And uh, you know, with with Bass Myers and uh, you know the assortment of of good fundamentally sound players there they're going to be a tough they're going to be a tough out yeah and they they're they're finding ways to win the close games right they they've had some really uh, close epic battles they did lose that that epic battle to cameo but it was a back and forth affair that was uh earlier on this season um the game they just won on friday night was kind of a wild one they're playing prairie essentially you know to, to play their way into the playoffs uh, only 10 seconds remaining, Will, and Louis Fabby finds Carson Schilling for a five-yard touchdown to give Clearwater Valley the 34-30 to win. What an exciting ba- uh, battle that was. Yeah, and in talking to Alan Hutchins after the game, the head coach at Clearwater Valley, he said this was not the this was not the, the beat-up, super shorthanded Prairie team of the previous few weeks. This was Prairie with their guys, and, you know, they may have been a little bit, um, what's the word I'm looking for, like, not super game sharp because a, a couple of like Trenton Lawrence hadn't played in a few weeks, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but, but they had, they had their guys and they knew that they were almost playing for their playoff lives. And, and we'll, we'll come back to that, but Prairie knew they needed a win. Clearwater Valley knew that they would really be helped by a win. And I think the, the game that you saw, you know, the, the, the nip and tuck right down to the final 10 seconds was a, a product of that. Yeah, both teams left it all on the field, no doubt about it. Uh, Louis Fabby, 130 yards, two touchdowns rushing, 137 yards, two touchdowns passing. Bass Myers, 119 yards rushing with a touchdown, 78 yards receiving with a touchdown. Good team win for Clearwater Valley. So Kamii and CV are in. They they have clinched. So that means this third auto bid uh, comes down to Lapway and Prairie, and Logos, and uh, Troy, kind of. Um, but basically, uh, and again, the White Pine League, all these teams are, are playing each other. There's some very important matchups. The clearest path is Lapway wins over Genesee, and they're in. Um, mm-hmm. Lapway has come from the back of the pack. They started slow, overcame some early injuries, and took a while to find their identity. And 
Lapway is a team I would not want to see in the opening round of the playoffs. That's for sure, Will. Oh, they're very explosive offensively, and that's that's kind of been their trade in recent years in football. Is um, you know you don't want to get into a shootout with them, and I think that that case still remains very valid. And and I also think the case that remains very valid that we've been saying since since we were talking about that eight man classic that the White Pine they lacked the one lead horse. They, they lacked that one runaway power, but what they didn't lack was depth. And you see it with the fact that here we are going into the last week and we're still talking about the possibility of a four-way tie for third place, which tells you that one through seven, even, even throw in Genesee, who's, who's down the line a little bit, but has been just, they've been battling injuries and obstacles all year that conference still plays, you know, really solid football. And there is not much to separate, you know, one through eight. There really isn't. And the fact that we're sitting here at this point talking about if if X, Y, and Z happens, then A, B, or C could happen. Um, and it's just, it's it's crazy how tight that margin for error is in that conference. And, you know, I'm, I'm not going to sit here and say there's no way Genesee beats Lapway. Um, I think Lapway is the favorite in that game. I think Lapway should be the favorite in that game. But Angus Jordan is as healthy as he's been pretty much all year. The Genesee quarterback, Nolan Bartos. You've got good players on that team. And there's there's something to be said about a team that has faced obstacles all year. They've been banged up. They've been hurt. Um, they've, they've had just all sorts of trials and turbulations. But there's something to be said for, you know, we we still have a say in this. You know, we might we might not be going to the playoffs, but we can help determine who does. And that's that's the chip that's sitting on Genesee's shoulder right now. And when they play on Saturday afternoon, there are going to be a whole lot of eyes on that field. Definitely. Um, and and that's the interesting thing is they play Saturday at one. So everybody else plays Friday night. And then we kind of have to just sit back and wait and see what happens on Saturday. It's I mean, be- and it can either be completely decided by then if, and, and and I'll let you get into the actual scenarios, depending on what happens Friday night, Saturday's game may not mean a whole lot. On the other hand, depending on what happens Friday night, you could have two, you know, a couple of different communities uh, becoming big fans of the Genesee Bulldogs and saying, Hey, let's go Genesee. Let's go blue and white. Uh, and it, and it, you know, you talk about you, you you prepare to play the game, but the circumstances happening around the game could be vastly, vastly different depending on outcomes that are that are outside of Lapway and Genesee's control. Yes. Um, I will say that in the conversations I've had that any any type of tiebreaker where it's Lapway and Prairie, Lapway, Potlatch, Lapway, Troy, all of these teams, Lapway, Loga, whatever it is, whatever the scenario is. Lapway wins the tiebreaker. Lapway wins all tiebreakers is basically what I heard from, from up north. So really for these other teams, Prairie, Potlatch, they they need Lapway to lose. That's that's what it boils down to. They they need Genesee to win to have a shot. And all of those teams have to win as well. Prairie plays Logos on Friday night. Uh, Troy plays Clearwater Valley. Kamii plays Potlatch. So I would say Prairie None of these are easy. Prairie, or ha- Prairie has the quote-unquote easier matchup over Potlatch. Um, but again, it would need to be a Prairie or Potlatch win coupled with the Lapway loss. That's the only way. If Prairie loses, if Potlatch loses, uh, it's pretty much a done deal in Lapway. Well, and like we've team. said, it's for all three of those teams, it's, it's really simple. If we want this to matter, we've got to win. There's, there's no backing in here. There's, there's no, there's for, for Prairie, they, they can't lose and then have a confluence of circumstances, see them make the playoffs. If the Pirates want to be in, um, if Potlatch wants to be in, they have to win and then see things happen from there. Um, so it's, it's really simple on Friday night for those two teams. If they want Saturday to matter, they've got to take care of business on Friday. Yeah, and I will say for Potlatch, there's an extra step added in where Potlatch needs to win, and then they need Lapway and Prairie to both mm-hmm. lose because Prairie has the head-to-head win over Potlatch from earlier on in the season. So, that's and Prairie of- says Logos. Prairie has Logos. You said yes. correct. Yes, that's Prairie. not a layup. 
No, that Logos team is very explosive offensively, and and they're they're a tough team. I, that's not if if I was going into a game with my season hanging in the balance, Logos was would not be my first choice of opponents. Let's put it that way. I mean, and no matter what path you take in the White Pine, it's going to be difficult. Speaking to the quality of the league, as we as we talked about, so we'll we'll have to wait and see what happens up there Friday night slash Saturday afternoon. District three. Oh man, what a breakthrough win for the Idaho City Wildcats. Uh, I'll admit this wasn't even on my radar, even remotely, but they come through with a, a big win over Rimrock, 68 to 50. And now it's the Wildcats who have played themselves into that second auto bid. At this point, Rimrock would need to upset notice, and I believe the tie break that would force a three-way tie between notice, Rimrock, and Idaho City. Um and uh, I believe it comes down to a point differential where not only would Rimrock have to beat notice, but they would have to do so by a pretty significant margin to, to come out ahead on this thing. So there seems to be a bit of a shift away from the Kansas city tiebreakers and two point differential where it allows. I mean, for years, it just seemed like, well, team X and team Y are tied and head to head doesn't settle it. So we have to do a Kansas city tiebreaker. We've, uh, you know, we've seen it before, but now there seems to be that shift more to a point differential. And and logistically, it makes sense because you'd sure hate to go into a Kansas City tiebreaker on Monday and have a player get injured or or a couple players get injured or something like that. And now not only are you playing down players, but you've got a short week. And potentially for, for Idaho City or Rimrock, uh, if, if it is one of those teams and if it did go to some sort of a Kansas City tiebreaker and they had to play it, you know, could you imagine having to have a short week and, and turn around and play, you know, Butte County or Grace? I mean, that's that, that's going to be a tremendously tall order. So I, I think that trying to stay away from Kansas City tiebreakers, though it's simplistic and ultimately settles events on the field. I, I think I kind of like the idea of going more to whether it's a point differential or whatever it is, trying to make it clearly defined ahead of time. Like you said, you know, Rimrock knows, okay, not only do we need to win, but we probably need to win by X number of points. Let's say that number is 20 just for the sake of conversation. So if they're ahead by 15 with two minutes to go and they get the ball back and you wonder why they're in the hurry up offense, it's because they've got to win by you know more than twenty points in that example. Um, it it just I think it, it just defines things a little bit more. And one of the things we've talked about a lot, and I've heard it I've heard it from coaches this week, the the frustration with not really understanding the Max Preps model when you're talking about potential at large and you're talking even about seeding, um, a team not understanding how they get from. The, the eight seed up to the six seed, or they got dropped from five down to nine or whatever, and not really understanding that. Having clarity and, and having transparency, uh, I, I think, is is ultimately a winner for, for everybody and everything. Yeah, I agree. And again, I believe it's a differential. I haven't been able to confirm that yet. So if there are fans out there. I, th that I think you're right. Because I've heard the same thing, though I haven't seen it in print anywhere. Yeah, I just I haven't been able to officially confirm that, but I, you know, based upon what I had heard and what I've kind of seen from the past, it's yes, I believe it's a point differential system. Either way, tall order for Rimrock to upset notice. I, I kind of anticipate notice in Idaho City being the two teams that make it from District Three. You I mentioned agree with that, but that's that's why you <laughs> lace up the the cleats and go play the game. That's right. Uh, you did mention the winner of that game probably plays Grace or, or Butte County or somebody in the first round. You know, they could play Cary potentially. Yeah, as well. that's, I mean, that's a brutal draw for whichever, yeah. whether it's Idaho City or Rimrock, they're most likely going to be the 12. And yes. so they're going to be playing the five. And as we've talked about, you know, you could argue one through six. There's not a whole lot separating one through six. So, you know, you're you're playing right out of the gates. You're playing one of the, the the best programs in the state. Yeah. Well, well, let's talk about these four teams all at the same time because they all kind of tie together. Uh, you've got Butte County and Grace playing for the District 5-6 championship. What's on the line? Well, the top four seed and a first round bye. The, the loser will get a home game, certainly. Then we'll probably have to travel for the quarterfinals. 
And then the other matchup is in District 4, a game that we'll have for you on IdahoSports.com this Friday night as Kerry hosts Raft River. Winner of that gets second place in District 4. Loser takes third. Either way, both teams comfortably, and both teams will have home games for the playoffs more than likely. How does it tie in? Well, Raft River and Butte County played each other in a non-conference battle last week, again, on IdahoSports.com, and Butte County won this game. That, again... The fact that Butte County won didn't surprise me, but the final score did, 38 to 14. Yeah, Butte County is they they've slowly started to play a little bit cleaner and a little bit better football as the season has gone on and and we've been saying since August that we thought that was a team that had very real state title aspirations and you know, it, it wasn't that they were playing poorly early in the season. Um I mean they were still winning games, they were still making plays, well for the most part winning games. But they, they'd have little hiccups here and there. And, and I think that caused some people to say, well, maybe not Butte County. Well, slowly but surely, they've rounded into form a little bit. And they play, um, you know, that very physical, very pound it style that is conducive to November football. When the weather may be not great, you might be playing outdoors. It's probably not going to be a shootout. And the fact that they can just line you up and punch you in the mouth over and over again. Butte County, to me, remains a very, very strong state title candidate. And as for Grace, I don't want to say they're a mystery because obviously they're not. Um, they're, they're a good football team. And we've talked a number of times this year about the fact that they play really good defense. But we just we haven't seen a lot uh, of Grace in that particular division. On the other side, um, Carry and, and Raft River, I think it's, you know, who takes care of the ball? Um, you know, which who's able to take care of them? If, if either of those teams are, are consistently taking care of the ball, not turning it over, um, you know, picking up first downs, they're very real threats to play deep in November. Definitely. Um, I want to. And to Oakley, be- let's not forget Oakley. <laughs> right. Um, and then before we before we shift gears, They've been loaded all year, right? You know, outside of that phenomenal game with Kendrick, the eight-man game of the year at this point, I don't know that any game can match what that game had. Oakley has played the entire year without Bryce Severe, and he was second-team All-State on offense and defense as a sophomore. Hasn't played, had not played at all this year, rehabbing from an injury until Friday. And the first carry he got as a running back, he goes 74 yards for a touchdown. And I wouldn't be surprised if, um, if the coaching, the coaches in Oakley kind of picked their spots with severe, but when you're dropping in a Bry severe, boy, what a, what a luxury that is. You know, they've still got Ethan Torbao. They've still got Houston Bingham, Porter Pickett. Keyshawn Crocker, uh, William Pregitzer, you go up and down, Bridger Duncan, Isaac Cranny. I mean, and now, and now, oh, here's Bryce Severe. You kidding me? Um, you know, you talk about an embarrassment of riches. Uh, that Oakley team offensive, I mean, if you're a defensive coach of one of these other 12, one of these other 11 teams in the 1A uh, Division I playoffs, I don't know how you scheme for that. I, and I'm not saying that rhetorically. I'm not saying that kind of in a, you know, a, a pandering kind of way. I'm saying that literally. You know, do you load up the box and then let Porter Pickett just throw it over the top to to receivers like Cranny and and, and uh, Pregitzer? Or do you play a little bit deeper zones and watch Ethan Torbau run for eight yards on every carry? And, oh, by the way, here comes Bryce Severe. And, oh, Houston Bingham, by the way, too. I mean, it's... I, I don't know if, if they're healthy and full go. I mean, that that's a defensive coordinator's nightmare because they can beat you a number of different ways. I, I think the formula has been laid out. You got to match Oakley score for score and hope you get the ball at the end, right? Kendrick did that to Oakley. Carey almost did it to Oakley. Raft River tried to do it to Oakley. I think that's the only way is – Mm. Can you match them score for score and maybe get a turnover somewhere? Because you're right. That offense is so good. I think that's the only way you're going to beat Oakley. Now there's a lot of teams that are capable of doing that. And well, uh, and that's, and that's where we talk about one through six, you know, and can, can Butte line up head to head and play with them. Yeah, I think so. 
can Raft River line up head to head and, and play with them? Yeah, I think so. Who beats them? You know, and that's and I'm not saying that as in I don't think anyone can. I'm saying in in the context of I, I think it's going to take a pretty good effort to to beat Oakley. Definitely. Uh, continuing the conversation in District Four again, it looks like those last two playoff spots are are Murtaugh's and Lighthouse Christians. Lighthouse Christian <laughs> continues to move up in the rankings every week. They've now leapfrogged Murtaugh. Murtaugh would be quote unquote the last team in now at four and three. Lighthouse at two and five is um they, they've got a home playoff game, Will. If the playoffs started today, Lighthouse is hosting Murtaugh in the opening round of the playoffs. On that nice new turf. That yeah. would be that'd be a good looking, a good looking game to go see. That is for sure. And and I, I like the way they play. I, I like the way that they play fast. They play aggressive. They're not afraid to drop back and throw it around. Justice Schrader's had a nice year at quarterback for them, the Glens Ferry transfer. And as we as we talk about um, how, like Butte County, for example, how their offense really translates to November football, the question is, does Lighthouse Christians, does a team that wants to drop back, drop back spread it out, run all over the place, you know, as far as running patterns and throw the ball all over the field. What happens on a cold, rainy, windy, you know, Twin Falls night in November? I think that that's a question to be answered. I know head coach Jason Smith, Jason Smith has a ton of experience. So I know that he's considered that. He's thought about that and he will have something ready if that situation arises. And the opposing coaches will know that too. The home team gets to decide, do we want to play it at our place? Do we want to go to a neutral site like Holt Arena? Yep. And a, pr a prime example I think of last year was in the semifinals when Raft River hosted Lapway. And Lapway had that explosive offense with Titus Year out. And Raft River said, you know, we could go to the Dome. We could go to Holt Arena. I think we'll stay outside and we'll make Lapway right here. Yep. play in the elements. And, and it worked out for Rat Forever as they got the semifinal win. So, yeah, very yeah. interesting. I love that part of the mechanism when we get to the playoffs to where do you play the game and depending on the opponent and all that good stuff. So that's that's what's going on at D1. Let's go to D2 where, again, it, it's pretty much buttoned up most of the way. Uh, Mullen St. Regis is seed 1A. Clark Fork is seed 1B. Kendrick is seed 2A. Uh, 2B will be decided Friday night when Lewis County plays Timberline. Council is seed 3A. Garden Valley is seed 3B. 3C still not decided. Horseshoe Bend uh, can get in with a win. If they were to somehow lose to Meadows Valley and Tri-Valley upset Council, then Tri-Valley would get that third spot. Again, that's a small probability of happening. You know, More than likely, it's going to be Horseshoe Bend. Um, Dietrich is seed 4A, Camas, or Castle Ford is seed 4B, Camas County and Hanson will play Friday for, for that third and final playoff spot, and then there's District 5, which still has to be sorted out. So let, let's talk about the games that are actually going to decide playoff spots. Let's start with Lewis County and Timberline. Talking to the Timberline coaches uh, two weeks ago, they are they're healthy. They had to forfeit their game against Kendrick because they just didn't have enough bodies, but they've kind of quietly gotten everybody back. They've played a couple of kind of JV contests the last two weeks against bigger schools, Lapway mm -hmm. and Orofino. They've won both those matchups. And I don't know, the more I'm looking at this matchup, I liked Lewis County coming in, but if Ty Hambly's not available, I think that tilts Timberline's way. Yeah. This, this matchup, I think the, the line a and line B on the keys to victory our, our health. If you take Ty Hambly out of Lewis County's lineup, even though they've got other good players, Gage Crow's a good player, um, that that dramatically alters Lewis County's look. On the other side, Rylan West, uh, who has had just a tremendous season, if you were to if he were to be injured and you were to take him out of the mix, that alters their look dramatically. So, you know, which which team has the edge in health might be the one that edge that determines. Uh, who ultimately wins the game. And, and Timberline, they've tasted a little postseason football the last couple of years. I guarantee you that they would like another bite at the apple. And whoever wins that matchup gets a home playoff game in the opening round as well. So that, there's a lot on the line there. Um, Horseshoe Bend uh, plays Meadows Valley. I just, I don't, I don't see a loss there. I think they get in as the three seed. They're kind of licking their wounds a little bit, but um, they've got a chance to get in. 
let's let's talk about Hanson in Camas County. I'll admit I've kind of been undervaluing Hanson all year. Mm -hmm. What do you think of this matchup? Well, talking to a couple coaches earlier in the year, I said, hey, what when you look at Hanson, what do you see? And they said, uh, you know, almost across the board, what I heard is, is they've got some players. What they don't have is a lot of depth. So, again, you know, health and availability, you know, who, if, if they've got all their ponies on the field um, or all their Huskies, as the case may be, um, you know, I, I think they got a chance to, to, to go, you know, go up against Camas County and give Camas County some, some trouble. I think Camas County probably has an edge. I think they're a little bit more athletic. I think they're a little bit faster. But at the same time, again, let's let's not underestimate when when you've got a big carrot hanging in front of you and a chance to go to the playoffs is a big carrot. Um, it's, you know, Camas County isn't, I don't think they're going to be able to just show up, you know, buckle up their chin straps and, and have Hanson just say, okay, okay, never mind. And, you know, it turns into a 70 to nothing type game. If if Hanson is is on that field and, and and they're healthy and they're 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 good to go in that regard, I think that they're going to be able to trade some punches. I still think Camas County probably wins that game, and I still think that they're probably the the team that that obviously gets that playoff spot. But I'm not I'm not going to write Hanson off. I'm not going to say they can't win that game. I, I think you're right when you say that Horseshoe Bend Meadows Valley. I think that. Um, you know, Meadows Valley has been, you know, right on that line of eight, nine, ten players all year. It's a second year program. You know, they're still trying to find themselves a little bit. I think Jim Rife and the Hanson Huskies, they know who they are. They're just going to have to execute against a good team, but they very much have a chance to do it. Yeah, fighting chance for sure. And then there's District 5-6 where uh, Water Springs beat North Gem in this round robin two weeks ago, 40 to nothing. Rockland defeats Water Springs last week in a pretty significant way. 70 to 20. Do you think yep. Rock you think Rockland was motivated here, Will? 70 to 20. They get the win. And now it all comes down to Rockland and North Gem on Friday. If Rockland wins, there's they're the, the seed one. Water Springs is seed two. North Gem's out of the playoffs. North Gem has to win to force a three-way tie. And I'll be honest, I don't know how that tiebreaker works out, but yeah, I'm, I'm really curious to see because we know North Gem, you know, Corey Hatch, the head coach there, he's not afraid to say, hey, we're going to run the ball and then we're going to run the ball. And then after that, we're going to run the ball. And then after that, we're probably going to run the ball some more. And and Rusty Hatch is coming off a 300-yard rushing game last week for North Gem. So they've obviously got some pieces in place that can do some damage. And then Rockland, the flip side of that coin, you know, Jerry Hunter is almost the exact opposite. You know, we're going to – we're going to look to get the ball downfield, and then we're going to look to get the ball downfield. And if that doesn't work, we're going to look to get the ball downfield. And the big change that they've made is, is Teague Matthews, they're, they're all worldwide receiver. They've moved him to quarterback. And last week he threw in that Water Springs game, he threw for over 400 yards. And, and this is a young man out of Rockland, Idaho, you know, the, the size of some people's backyards. He's getting Division One attention. Like there are schools – you know, the, the Idaho states and the Boise states and the Utah states of the world, they're, they're very aware of who this young man is. And now he's going under center. And then, you know, I'm, I'm saying this jokingly, but the, the best news for, for North Gem of, of Matthews going under center is now they don't have to cover him downfield. And most teams, their defensive backs are 5'8", 5'9", 5'10". Matthews is 6'4", 6'5". So, you know, it's, it's almost – it can almost be construed as a bit of a blessing because he was such a mismatch on the outside. However, if he's going to turn around and just be throwing BBs all over the field, carving up defenses with his arms, you know, maybe it turns into a little bit of a pick your poison. If, if you're North Gem. it's going to be a fascinating matchup. I, I like Rockland North Gem just to seemed a little off to me this year. Um, they really, I think that Camas County game really opened my eyes in the middle of the season where um, there was a blueprint on how you can beat North Gem. And I think a lot of teams have followed that recipe this year. So and we'll see. Bridger Hatch. Um, and obviously, I mean, the, the young man's playing college football now, so we don't need to, to spend a lot of time, you know, discussing his physical abilities. But 
you know, it, it just it it has felt like North Gem has been, you know, they they need that one more weapon. You know, they they've got good players. Their defense has played better in recent weeks, uh, a little bit more consistently in recent weeks. But it feels like they've needed that one more guy. Whereas last year it was Yost and and Bridger Hatch. This year, you know, it's it's Rusty Hatch, and and you need you know you need a couple more ponies to go with him and and we'll see if they've got kids who can step up this week because you know Rockland's a good team but they're they're three and four you know they're they're not infallible they're not unbeatable definitely yeah and I, I think Brett Yost is kind of quietly a big loss for them as well you know very he, big yeah. he was the kind of the fullback last year and, and he really did a lot of that dive stuff in that North gem offense. Um, you know, when you look at the North gem roster and then, you know, we'll, we'll wrap up the the podcast here, but when you look at this North gem roster, it's still, you know, they're pretty young. They've only got two seniors this year, Dallas hatch on the line and Cade Hill. Otherwise it's all junior sophomores and freshmen. So maybe a year away, um, but they're, they're good. Yeah. And I think there are a number of teams in D two that you could argue are, are a year away. You know, Council's only got like three seniors. Garden Valley, I think, has four. Kendrick, I think, is at three or four. Um, you know, I, I think there are a lot of teams. Tri Valley, who we've talked about a number of times, you know, they a lot of sophomores and juniors carry in that team. You know, it's not that not that we're closing the book on this year. You know, we've still got playoffs to play, and I know there are a lot of teams. You know, especially when you get down like the Dietrichs and, and the, the Castle Fords, they want their shot at Kendrick. They they want to they want a chance to to take down Goliath. Um, but next year, it just it has the looks of just being a, a, a crazy wide open, just deep deep race because there's a lot of teams returning a lot of talent. Yeah, it's going to make uh, next year's playoffs a lot of fun for sure, but we've got this year's playoffs to get through still. And we'll next week, we will have actual locked in brackets and matchups to talk about. We'll break it all down for you again. Um, what are you going to do without week? Bubble Watch every week? I do, well, it's going to free up an entire day of my week. I mean, it literally takes me a day to put all that together for sure. Um, don't worry, there's plenty of. I'm, I'm kind of in that in between where I'm emailing all of the basketball coaches, you know, for season previews there. So it's uh, nonstop for sure. I will mention, well, something we're doing Friday night. Um, after all the games are over Friday night, we're going to be hanging out on Twitter. We're doing the Twitter spaces with the Idaho oh, sports.com cool. Twitter account. We're going to go from 10 30 to 1130 to kind of get that raw mountain time. I presume. Yes. Mountain time. Yes. So okay. it would be 930 not... to 1030. If you're up in the panhandle. Yes. Thanks for the, the clarification there. Will. um, so I'll, I want all the eight man fans to hop on. Cause you're going to get uh raw reactions from myself and the other Idaho sports.com broadcasters about what we saw. And we're going to react to the scores as they're coming in in real time. They give it as like an overtime uh, period after the games are all over for a little post game discussion. It's going to be a lot of fun. So yeah, good. Looking forward to it. Yes, definitely. So stay tuned for that Friday night on Twitter. Um, you don't have to have a Twitter account to listen. Um, you can listen totally without that. So it'll be a lot of fun. Um, okay. We will uh, see you next week. Enjoy the competitions this weekend, everybody. And um, we'll be back next week to break down the playoffs right here on the Idaho 8-Man Prepcast on IdahoSports.com.